previously we looked at this Samsung Series 7 Q7 TV with one connect box and this fiber one connect cable. We took it all apart and saw the interesting things. Then we had a look at this quite new 8K uh, TV one connect box and it's horribly stiff thick cable that they gave with it instead of the nice fiber cable. Today we've got something else new and exciting to look at. It's going to be an unboxing experience. What we have here is the 2021 43 inch class, the frame QLED 4K smart TV. All exciting, it does picture stuff. Yeah, all that good stuff going on. Do more from home with the frame. You can use it as a computer screen. More ways to connect instantly. All that wonderful stuff. This is what you see when you open the box. It's some instructions on how to do things. I don't know where that starts. It starts at one, I guess. How the one connect hooks up. One connect box, special fiber cable, goes into the panel, then there's the connections on the one connect box. You get a little angled thing, little clip thing, little that thing, the feet for the TV, you lay it flat, you decide whether you want to have it up or down by 0.98 inches, and you twist this little thing over, insert the feet, then you lift it up without smashing it, hopefully, plug in the cable, lay the cable into the grooves, stick a little thing on to the vents and it clips the cable, don't do it tighter than that, don't whatever that is, the remote, I don't, we don't really need to go through that but that's what you see first. You get this good sack of goodies and this box in addition to the panel. We'll have a look in here first, you get all these good things, the remote, this is interesting. They've changed. The frame TVs used to come with this quite ugly, cheap feeling thing, which is quite, I don't know, it just, it's not a very expensive feeling thing. This is something that you'd see from your bargain basement TVs, cheap plastic, not a nice feel or look. Whereas now they've upgraded to giving the frame TVs the more nice well, the more high-end remote that you'd get with the expensive uh, Q-series TVs. These nice metal remotes. Except you don't get a metal one, you get a plastic one. But it still has a nice shape and feel to it, although it's not the nice feel of metal. But interesting now, they've got the solar panel there, or USB charging. So in theory, you can leave that sitting with the solar panel up and it will charge so you don't need to replace batteries previously you would slide that out and the batteries are in there yes but now you don't have to do that you don't have to replace the batteries you just charge it and if it's not getting enough light you can do it by the usb port so that's quite i'm pleased they've put in a nicer looking remote the power cord there's some bits for the wall mounting that aerial thing that we discussed previously, the little bending clip for the cable, the one connect cable. So we can see it's a little bit different to the earlier versions, which were quite thin and quite invisible. These ones didn't carry any power, there's no electrical connection in here, it's only glass eight fibers. Now we have power and fibers over the same cable. So you don't need to plug the TV into power anymore like you did with these ones. You just plug this in, that's the TV end. It takes that wide one and that's the one connect box end. Interesting that is different to what we found on the 8K TV. The TV end is narrower and wider by a small amount and the one connect box end is now 
well, depends which one's newer, I don't know which one's newer, uh, these, but, yeah, the 8K one is a slimmer, wide one, when this is a fat one. And there's some other differences we'll get into which are interesting. So now you don't have to plug the TV into power, which is quite nice. It makes the setup a bit more tidy. It's got these special thingies you can put over it to make it look nice when you're not using it. Not really sure what the idea of that is. This new wall mounting system where it's two metal plates that you screw on the wall and you work out where to put them from this poster that you tape onto the wall and then it shows you where to drill to screw those brackets on the wall. Two things and then there's some large headed screws in there which you screw into the back of the TV panel and then they keyhole into the slot so it hangs nice and flat against the wall. That's quite good. Different to the previous years. Various bits and pieces. Some more quick start type things. Some important safety precautions. The wall mount installation guide. That to get these things a left and a right. And then those two screws. Some pieces for going into your wall depending on what type of wall you have. And you get those, I guess. I don't know what that is. Is it that? Oh, is that tape? Yeah, okay, I was wondering what this is. It's little clear stickers. I thought that was for securing your One Connect cable down the wall, but it looks like you use that to tape the poster up to your wall. I guess it's a sticker that's easy to peel off and doesn't rip your wallpaper off or your paint. Yes, interesting. So apparently you can also put this TV in portrait orientation, which is interesting. I'm not sure how that works when you're watching TV on it. I wonder if it automatically senses that. We have to experiment. Instructions about the remote and charging it. They don't give you a USB-C cable for that. You have to get one from your non-Apple phone. And these, you can get my shelf studio stand or customizable frames for the TV. Very good, all the things you need. You get this little clip thing for mounting the one connect cable around a corner, I guess. And that, which is a little clip thing they reckon you're supposed to put on the back of the One Connect box. Okay, very good. Now, the main event. Oops, okay. It's quite a tight fit in that box. And now we've wrecked the bag. It's no longer mint condition. There we go, one connect box. It's now big and chunky. So it used to be thin like this. So it's a little bit shorter now. Uh, but that's because now it has to have a power supply in it big enough to run the TV. The USBs are on the end. I don't know why they did that, because that's a bit annoying. Could have been over here, but the, yeah, probably because they got that card slot thing. So the specifications of this, it's a, the output's now 350 volts DC, 170 watts, and 13 volts, 5 watts. And this is 2021 10th month, so it's quite a new one. Turns out I've got another one. This is an older version, 2020 10th month, so it's one year older. But this is for bigger TVs. 275 watts versus 170 watts. So that one there is for the 65 inch Q95 TV. There's this one, interesting. It's for the 43, the 50, or the 55 inch LS03, the frame TV. So we're gonna take this apart. Here's the TV with the one connect cable there coming out the back of it. Let's Get it up and running. Connect that up. Connect a video source. And we've got a power cord. Ah. That's a bit unfortunate. Well, it sort of goes. Uh, but it looks like the panel is a bit sad about something. Hmm. 
Oh well, let's take it apart. Yeah, so when you unplug that, the TV goes off. Now I can hear a relay clicking in here. Uh, perhaps we should unplug it with this still attached in case it discharges something. This is unplug it and plug it in many times. Okay, so it goes back to the previous source it was on, which is quite nice. It is interesting that even though it says on the bottom of these 220 to 230 volts AC, you can run them off 120 volts and they seem to work fine. I'm wondering if there really is a different version for the 100 and 120 volt regions or if they just put the same thing in and just change the label. It doesn't really make sense because these these older ones were 100 to 240 volt input. But uh, the power factor boost converter in this is probably changed slightly to deal with having to boost a longer distance for the 100 volt and 120 volt inputs. So it might be experiencing too much peak current when you run these ones on 120 volts. We'll have a look inside and see if we can determine if that's a problem or not. What's really interesting is with these older ones, the all of the intelligence and processes and operating systems and everything to do with the TV is in this box. So when you do off-air scheduled recordings onto a USB drive, if you plug that drive into a different One Connect box, it will just say can't play due to digital rights management. And if you change this box to a different TV, you need to go into the service menu and configure the model number, the panel type, the local dimming type, otherwise they won't work correctly. And I thought that was going to be the same with these, but by experimenting with these two, I found that does not appear to be the case. It seems more like this is just an I.O. hub thing and all the intelligence remains in the TV because if we connect it to this other one see they used to have a little gaming symbol on the previous ones which is not there now maybe all inputs support gaming? I don't know because that doesn't even make sense because you can put inputs on these into gaming mode so I, maybe that's been changed through firmware updates but anyway anyway so the TV comes up and, strangely, it's now complaining about the One Connect box with the little picture there saying you've got to plug it in. But it worked fine the other day when I tried it with no complaints whatsoever. It just worked. Yeah, now it doesn't. It's, it only works for a short period of time now. But what I experienced when it was working is that the remote still worked. Whereas on these older ones, when you swap them around, you have to repair the remotes, because the remotes use Bluetooth. And with these ones, I found I could play back the recordings that were made on the same TV, but with a different One Connect box. So it suggests that the operating system and the other intelligence, the Bluetooth pairing, the channels, all, all the things are stored in the TV on these newer ones, not in the One Connect box. So I assume when we take it apart we're going to see a very simple board here, like what we saw in the 8K one, it didn't have very much stuff on it. And when we take apart the TV, we'll probably find that there's more CPU business going on inside the TV. So I don't know why this is complaining, because it worked fine the other day. Maybe there is a slight difference between them that only works on certain days. Doesn't really make sense. See, it works briefly. Anyway, let's take these apart and look in the One Connect box first. Again, these have a IR permitting look to them. And now, unlike that other one, these actually have all screws. Well, that's nice and well done up. And the back ones are well, well tight. So now what? Does the lid come off? It does, look at that. We're in already. That's, I think that's a lot easier to open than the other one. There's a label telling you that that's the top. 2021, 10th month, 6th day. Okay. It's sort of like a heat sink in the top. Yes, there's 
aluminum plate in there. So that must push on those heat sinks. And I think we should check those capacitors since we had this on just then, just in case. 7 volts. Okay, we'll probably be fine then. It was the intention by unplugging the power while the TV was on, is that that would help promote it discharging properly without us having to do anything. The power comes in here. There's a relay. Two relays. One must be a pre-charge and one the standby. Filters. Two rectifiers in parallel with the provision for a third there. And then we got there's probably the power factor chokes. And interesting there there's different footprints available. You can see there's more holes there. So there must be bigger versions for the higher current and then these fits along the heatsink there there are two more footprints there it looks like there is option for bigger capacitors see there's dotted lines and then there's solid lines then there's transformers the one must be the standby and one's the main power that goes to the over to the panel so this is supposed to be 300 volts is it 350 volts so it's probably a one-to-one -one transformer there. Presumably they isolate it. Power Technologies Corpse. So it says there 350 volts, 0.53 amps, or 350 volts, 0.64 amps. Ah. And there is a little table there about the input rating. So there's a 100 to 240 volt, or there's a 200 to 240 volt for China. So this is the China version. And that's slightly older, 8th month, 21. And how do you know which version you got? Because they haven't ticked either of them. Danger. It does say there to discharge between those points. I also have arrows pointing to a fuse there. That must be a live heatsink. How do we see what version we've got? Ah, uh, see, it says there C or D, which is probably that. 166C. So we have the smaller one, which is what we expected, because this comes with that 43-inch panel, quite small. But it doesn't tell you which one we got here. Uh, does that mean that either of them can be... It's just the value of the fuse that changes and nothing else? I wonder what fuse it's talking about. It doesn't give a designator. There's a fuse there, which is a 3.15 amp. There's, there's a fuse here which is a 6.3 amp so that's not what that doesn't even comply with that because that just says 3.5 or 2 amps anyway who knows let's take this board off and have a look underneath it i think we'll make a, se a separate video where we compare this to the other one connect box from the larger tvs just to keep this one on focused about the 43 inch frame tv it feels like quite a flimsy bracket that it's attached to. What else is holding this down? Oh, it's just tape. Okay. Was it for heat sinking? Oh, it's got really thick coatings on there. Okay, so all this section here is the primary mains input side. A massive spark gaps there to ground, although it's not a grounded appliance. Interesting. The board also looks kind of bent. I don't think it is. Yeah, so there's an isolation gap there, which is what the transformers cross. And there's five optocouplers on there. There's probably some power on off the voltage feedback. There's probably independent power supplies for each. That one there might be the little auxiliary one for the 12 volts. Self-contained and then these other controllers for the main one for the high voltage. So that means the high voltage is going down this connector. This thing here. Probably on those end ones that are separate. And you see it's got two separate blue wires. I'd say those will be the positive high voltage. And then the ground for it will just be the rest of the ground it says there yes look at that minus b 
350 volts plus. Oh, that's minus for that one and plus for that one. And then there's the analog. What is this analog? Auxiliary. Probably auxiliary. 13 volts plus and minus. It also says there A11.8 up. Is that referring to that jumper? The jumper there. Now we can see there's the optical thing to shine out and repeat the IR signals that are received by the TV. Uh, there's a chart there which tells us what revision we've got. Still doesn't tell us anything about what input rating we have. See they've got the proper 8mm creepages there for double insulated. Double insulated symbol there. And should have that creepages across here as well. Yeah, that transformer's even got a, a barrier that comes through the board there to help with the creepage and there's a slot under the optocouplers. They've done a good job at getting it to comply with the standards. So does this come off now? And there's more screws under it. Uh, this probably heat sinks the bottom part. This stuff gets really hot when running. Well, on the big TVs it does. You feel quite a lot of heat coming out of the vents. Ah, oh, it looks like it might be heat sinking to the bottom side. Yeah, it's bowling the board up. One chip. No, nothing was pushing on it. Maybe it's heat sink on the bottom. Hmm, so you can see that's where the card... I think it's called a CI card for the encryption in some countries. Uh, look, there's another IR emitter there. Now there's positions where they could be there and there, but they're not fitted. It looks very similar to the board that is in these, the, the thin ones. Although the layout is quite different. The shape of it and having those on the corners, it's very similar. Here's one that I've been playing with. Oh no, the board is narrower. But those corners are so similar with the IR emitters. The chips are different though. That's got an exposed, two exposed dies. I just put these heat sinks on because I was experimenting with it while it was running. That gets really hot. Be dissipating a few watts. Okay, we'll take out the board and have a look under it. Interesting to see what is that. There's heaps of tracks going through there. It doesn't look like there's any HDMI switching chip. It must all be done in this Samsung thing. Oh, look at that. That's a 2020 board. They must not have needed to update that for a while. It's probably common to all the TVs that use that same one connect cable. Ah uh, yes, there's heat sinking on the bottom by the sound of it. Yep, look at that. Two blocks there. That's very strange because massive heat sinking block there doesn't even go on the bottom of that chip. Barely touching the edge of it, because that chip's, chip's there. And then the one over this side, there, what is that doing? Nothing. Gets just the the tip of that tuner module. It seems, it's, that's very strange. They don't really know what's going on, do they? Doesn't make sense why they'd put those in there and not line them up properly with the devices. The other ones had a heat, quite a good heatsink on the tuner. It was on the top of it, I think. I think they could have lined that up better. So we've got USB ports here. I wonder if that's the same chip to what we had last time. That little four port USB 2 hub. We got one per per USB port. I wonder if that's a protection thing so that you don't end up blowing up the main processor by you know, doing something dodgy on the USB ports. So there's data pairs that come out of the tuner. Seem to go through some sort of filtering there. Then carry on all the way up across to there. And then on the bottom side come along and then cross back to the top and then come down through more filtering down into there everything's handled by this one chip i think every hdmi port's the same it's got some little esd suppression diodey things there little array and then they just go straight into this chip all of them the ethernet similarly there's probably magnetics built into that because it's quite a deep socket there and then it's just 100 megabits, so it's two pairs. Another ESD filtery thing. And that goes up and into the chip. It's very integrated. Everything's handled in one chip. And then for the one connect, 
we've got four main data pairs by the look of it and then two auxiliary pairs it seems quite consistent with what we saw in the 8k tv where we looked in this connector here and we saw rx tx and then four main data pairs the tc t0 t1 t2 and then there were a couple of control lines like active tv active one connect and a 13 volts and then the power pretty similar it's going to be a little bit different to what we saw for the older one connect box because this one has less intelligence in it i believe it's more of just a switch like an input router rather than the whole processor for the tv let's take this apart and see what's in the connectors do we want to destroy a really nice expensive cable uh, we'll try not to destroy it we just want to investigate it hopefully okay well that's falling apart oh look at that it's soldered not not spot welded like that 8k one yeah, it even says top and bottom on it that's quite nice and the molding doesn't go over the metal well everything about it is nicer than this terrible thick stiff annoying one while we're here we might as well do it all looks like it's just clipped it's not actually um it's not glued it's just snapped together so hopefully we didn't snap off we should be able to put it together it's interesting they put the same texture on these that that they have on the back panel of the TVs. Again, that one's soldered together, and it also says top and bottom on it. It's really interesting to see that one. We didn't open that on the HK one. So we'll start getting this loose, and then once we've got some pressure on it, we can try desolder that stuff. We need to get a knife to go in there. Okay, we'll try pry up these little clips without causing damage. Okay, they opened up pretty easily. The top one goes under the bottom one, right at that edge there, which makes it difficult to put a leverage on there, because I think it's getting caught by the piece in there, needing to bend around. Let's see what happens. Might as well get this one started as well. Let's see what we can do. Oh, look at that. Got in there. We're going to have to take some good photos of that to look close up. Uh, this one might be tricky because it's long and very heat sinky. Yes, there we go. Get in there. Okay, ah, let's just tidy that up. Okay, what have we got here? Huh, there's no active components in there. Well, no, like, IC buffer thing like we saw in the, in the other TV. How many pores have I all stuck down by glue there? And then there's this tape over the top. Okay, so we've got... One, two, three, four, five, six, six pairs. So it's what we saw on the other side, which was the presumably the four high speed pairs and then the two auxiliary data. And then we've got this stuff here, which looks like there's three. Oh, there's another one on the other side. There's four power cores, which are quite thin, but in this case, they don't carry much current like on the other TV, the HK one where it was low voltage and high current tells you about it on here. So it's 60 degrees rated, there's a UL number on it, an e-file number E487874, CUL US, AIM22136, is that 60 degrees C, 350 volts DC, 226AWG, and 232AWG. I wonder, does it take low voltage as well as high voltage? Because they talked about 13 volts. I have to investigate that. 
then it's got some other stuff 1 slash 2 a slash b ft1 ft2 not sure what that is vw1 i think is that the flammability and then something else 0359 okay think we need to get this apart more can we do that without wrecking it are we even allowed to look at it apparently not there we go so it must have six fibers fibers doesn't really tell us anymore does it there's this a little sticker in the way i guess i'll try and peel those off i do want to get to the bottom see what's going on on the bottom side is that a good idea it's cr the board is snapped down into position by these little hooks it has got this little frame in there but that just goes over the edges of the board it doesn't do things it's not secure unless it's got this tray unless it's sitting in this tray anyway i'll think about this and we'll also we'll get the tv apart i'll we'll try and get the tv apart and we'll have a look in there as well all right we're gonna have a look at the tv itself here it is on its front the stands or legs or whatever they slide in there onto those bolt teeth things the one connect cable goes in here and that's the only connection you get to take this apart i don't recommend you take apart your tv unless it is broken it is very difficult to get the back off but you can see there is a small notch start off with a screwdriver prying in there until it goes snap and comes up and then you get hold of it and you just reef on it really hard and it undoes clips except when it gets to the top edge i ended up snapping the back in both corners you really got to get it around the edge and start doing it from this side because if you try doing it by pulling on the bottom here and lifting it up that way it ends up snapping the back off as you can see there and also clips get snapped off so it's the same as in the q7 tv we saw where there's this wire going through which snaps around these plastic hooks and that's down the sides and i don't know what it, well, along the bottom it was just a couple just one in the middle i think that it seemed a bit more rigid on the bottom perhaps because it has that guide for the one connect cable along there so this is what you see in the tv but speakers on the sides the one connect goes in there and this board has some kind of chip on it under that heatsink plate power it goes through some decoupling by the look of it there some inductors perhaps and then goes over to here in this corner you can see there's an isolation boundary really nice flat transformer here really long thin capacitor 450 volts so the main 350 volt supply comes in there it's already dc there's a capacitor some filtering this cap and there must be some active components on the bottom and then the main power supply transformer then there's rectifiers on the output um, there's some sort of lift wire there there must be more rectifiers and things on the bottom and then there's smoothing capacitors this must be a low voltage supply it does say there 13 volts 12.35 volts 13 volt test point there and 125 volts up here, which will be for the the backlight. Wow, it's got 500 volt caps there. Backlight must be a lot of LEDs in series. So the backlight connection, I believe, is that there. There's a connector there. There's no nothing else coming off this board. That just goes to the control board. We've got the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth here. Down the bottom, sort of hanging down. That joins up by that cable speakers it's just two channel audio in this tv and here must be some amplifiers probably that there yeah looks like you can probably get a fancier model that has more channels of sound when they populate that and there's this cable here ribbon cable which goes to the either ir sensor and other 
power switch. Not sure how that's attached. I'm pretty sure this frame, the surround part of the TV, is part of the panel. It doesn't seem to be able to come off. And it's also interesting how flimsy the connections to the panel are. You see they have there are dies on this flex. See the outline of them there. And they're just flapping around in the breeze. That was peeled out of it when I opened it up because that tape had let go. And there's a link across. So that's the main connection to the panel. Quite a lot of waves there. I don't know if they're all used. Mm, all the connections are along the bottom edge of the panel and then it will be taking a path around the edge of the glass up for the rows. Let's have a look. Let me pull the speaker off. I if there's two drivers in there. Or maybe it's just each side. It's got a port path by the look of it on there. And some magnetic shielding. And you can see the part number of the panel. 2021-1029 Alright, we're going to take this off and have a look under it and we'll do the same for that The cracks in the glass are spreading but we can see there when you put the TV in portrait orientation the picture does rotate so that's interesting, I'm not sure how you use that for watching TV It'd be a bit weird wouldn't it? Yeah, there must be a rotation sensor somewhere in there all right, we're back on the bench. I've got the boards out of the TV or off of the back of the panel. Uh, this one here, there's not very much to see. I'm not sure whether we should try ripping it apart because I want to get a new replacement panel for this TV. So I'm not sure how much I should be destroying it because that might... Yeah, I suppose we can try peeling that off, but if it's like the others, it will be not willing to come off. Yeah, it is a little bit of a shame that I snapped the back panel in two places trying to get it off. Back panel of the TV. So it's heat sinking on the bottom of the board, which is pretty interesting. There must be a lot of stuff going on in here. We'll try popping these clips off and see if that gets us anywhere. Uh, if it's not gonna release the heat sink, then we'll just put them back. And the panel got quite a bit more damaged in that whole process of pulling the back off the TV because once there's a crack in the glass it's just going to keep spreading okay the heatsink has come off yeah once because it needs so much leverage to release the clips on the back panel if there's a crack in the glass already it's just going to spread once you apply force look at that it came off probably means we're going to need to redo this thermal interface to put it back because yeah that crusty stuff's not going to survive is it it's one of those thermal setting types okay so we have a special cpu thing got a whole bunch of lanes there going to the panel and we've got all our lanes there coming from the one connect it's interesting now that they don't put any buffers in the one connect cable connectors it just goes straight in all the way into a cpu thing after coming out of the CPU thing over here. I suppose there's buffers in the little LED or laser drivers. It's interesting they've glued some parts there. I wonder what that's all about. It's probably about making it hard to read what they are. I think it said on the 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 thing about this TV that it now has 16 gigabytes of storage for your custom or your own purchased or added artwork for the the frame feature. I suppose that's one of those chips. I remember the firmware for these TVs being several gigabyte downloads. That must be a power supply chip there with all these inductors and things. Probably makes a whole bunch of different voltages for the the panel. Yeah, that's quite likely. Look at all those tracks there that are coming out from the panel. It might be all different bias voltages. And yeah, we can't see where anything goes on the other side, but presumably those come out in here. Where there are heaps of little tracks coming out of that IC going into wires, probably goes to there. Then there's a bunch of other tracks that come out of the CPU thing and some off the panel that go up to this, presumably. It looks like it up to that connector. I don't know what that goes to because it wasn't connected to anything. It says UTCN1101UT. Don't know what that is. 
Yeah, so there's another an option for another audio amplifier there, and then there's an option for a different type of connector there, so you can get more audio channels. There's various test points there by the look of it. Might be for some sort of factory programming thing. And there's options for a bunch of connectors on the bottom and there. I wonder if those are all test things if they were used during prototype stages. Interesting, quite a dull coppery appearance. I wonder if it's got an OSP protection, organic solder protective. This doesn't look like an ENIG type thing. It's not gold. We clean that off. Yeah, it's all cracked off. Hopefully it will be fine to put paste back instead of that thick stuff. You now made a mess everywhere on the board. You can see now what is this chip. It's a Samsung Quantum Processor 3. Is that um, 2021 34 week? Could be, that seems to correlate with everything else. Other Samsung chips. Nice length matching going on. How many pairs go to the screen? I don't know what kind of interface that is. Two per chip, six chips, 12, and then a whole bunch of other things, which is probably bias voltages coming from those thingies there. Uh, we can sort of see there is some numbers in there. Guessing they put that glue on there to make it hard to read. I'm not sure what the point of that would be. Anyway, that's the processor main board. And here's the power supply board. It gives you a pin out there. Blue backlight unit, I guess, on PWM1 and 2. There's two channels, 13 volts on four pins. There's ground on four pins, so no connects. Then there's the B, the main power supply, 350 volts, and then grounds for that. So that's, you can see there on the connectors, the 350 volt connection there. There's a fuse. Pretty high... High current fuse there, and then inductors, capacitor, long skinny capacitor. Then there's a control chip there, switch mode controller of difficult to read. Then there's the FETs to switch the current into the primary of this transformer. And then on the output, diodes, service mount, D packs. There's two lots of diodes there. There's those leaded ones, which you can see from the other side. So they're going off to the backlight driver by the look of it and that must be high voltage because there's a 500 volt caps there so the backlight stuff's pretty angry and then these ones here will be a higher current lower voltage which go through to the through these caps and then into here so that will be the 13 volts i don't know if they give a pin out for this which is an interesting connector which was goes directly onto the back of the panel for the backlight Maybe it tells us here, 146 volts, 1 to 2 channels at 278 millivolts, 100% duty, 300 hertz dimming. And then, so there's two 13 volt outputs, a low current one, maybe that's a standby supply, and then the main one, 3.2 amps. I'm surprised, do the two 13 volts actually come out? In different places or is it the same thing? So that's the pin out for the LED connection. So it looks like there's pairs of pins, you know, pluses and minuses, and links. And they tell you where the gluing needs to go, bonding. With a little hatched area. That's quite neat. Same one here. And that's a keep out, I guess. A stop. Because of the double insulating. Now we were looking, was there different 13 volts? This backlight on PWM 1 and 2, analog dimming, signal ground, and we got B 13 volts. Is there any other 13 volts? I don't think so. Very well. Thought we should have a go at looking up the numbers on those chips. There's the quantum processor over here. Uh, that's a little thingy in, along the way. We're going to this guy. There you go. Look at that. Can see it. A VPM S3RT. Couldn't find any information about that other than the Google search preview, which says Samsung IC DC DC converter 72 pin QFN. All right, then. What about the audio amplifier here? 
It's a burr brown. What part of that's the part number? Is it a eight oh oh two a perhaps? Ah, uh, this might be the same one that was in the other TV. Yeah, T A S five seven five six M. I think that's what it turns out to be, according to some comments on Reddit. I think it's this guy, which we probably looked at before for the other TV. A good old Class D amplifier. Uh, what else did we want to look at? The other things were the power supply stuff on this board. See what the main input switcher is. is. Where is that hiding? There. What is that logo? 6N2 something, depending on where the light's reflecting off of it. 6, 6 n 20 in 11 maybe and yeah, 6n20n11 another one of those hard to identify things or oh, it's maybe it's the other part number there the other number there what does that say six something or other oh, annoying reflections of that stuff can't work out what side the reflections coming from 6b something nine six B19. I don't know about that. I'm yeah, not sure about that. The other thing is what we had in the the One Connect power supply on the bottom of the board here. I don't know what this thing is. That thing there by itself, which only seems to have two terminals. I don't know what that is. I have to lift the camera up perhaps. So what is that? A cap 200, was it that AN number? I'm not sure what that there is. It seems to be, it must be some kind of clamp thing, because it's just all terminals on each side are joined together. That's quite strange. Is it some kind of clamping thing? Maybe it's a transor. Transorb. Okay, what about this one here? Can we see what this is? I can see that there are numbers in there. Is that say 5-4 something or other? Try and get it around the right way first. So I'm not looking upside down, that will help. And it looks like it says CP8063 on the bottom there maybe? Or 15AK85. 15AK85. They use really non-common things. Okay, what about the bottom number then? Which seems to be... Oh, no, is that UCC in the bottom corner there? UCC 2806. That sounds better. That's an actual part number, isn't it? UCC 2806. A natural interleaving transition mode PFC. That's... That's what we want. That's an actual thing that exists. So that will be the controller for the primary side, because I've got two chokes there, two inductors there, so it makes sense that they'll use a controller such as that. Natural interleaving transition mode PFC controller with improved audible noise immunity. Is this what we looked up before in the 8K box? Could be, it makes sense that they use similar devices. So that's a pretty standard affair. So we've got two other controllers. We'll look at the one for the auxiliary switch mode first. Um, get this sorted out. This guy here, uh, that doesn't look very... It looks like SK. Oh, that's no good, is it? We might have to abandon that one. Or we could try a side light. If we light it from the side, does that help? No. Okay. What about the other chip? Which will be the controller for the main switch mode. That's uh, another one with that logo that we couldn't identify for. It's also under heaps of blobbed out stuff. And what is this? A 6... A 6C213? A 6C213... 387 maybe? Gets nothing. 
Or what's that bottom one? 6B22. But then that's not enough information to actually give you some an answer. Possibly comes up with some stuff though. Seems to be a known thing. Okay, so it's an FA6B. It's good when the companies leave out part of the part number. I didn't recognize that. It's what we've looked up before. It's Fuji Electric. It's another one of those things that you can't find any information about. Yeah, so it's a Fuji 6 FA. I don't think there's any going to be any decent information about that, unfortunately. Well, there's some data about a similar device. It's a 6B20. We got a 6B22. And then there's some example circuit there with it. Yeah, very well then. That's a look at some of the components involved in the TV. Very good. Next time we'll perhaps look a bit closer at the one connect cables and the in the other higher higher current the bigger one connect box that can do the bigger TVs and we'll see if it's got different parts there and more rectifiers and all that stuff that's all for today though